Greg Dimmick really does not need a lot of introduction for uh, most of you. Uh, you who were lucky enough to, those of you who were lucky enough to attend the first symposium will remember um, Greg. And the archaeological work that he is doing is something that he is so passionate about uh, that it, it sort of rubs off on you. Um, he is here to speak to you about the Marta Lodo and the continuing work that you were doing, that, that he is doing there. Um, Greg, thank you. Thank you, Jan. I really appreciate being here. Uh, some of you that uh, had flyers on this meeting expected Governor Mark White to be speaking, and I have to admit that I've never been governor of Texas, <laughs> but I want to make sure to note that I was on the Wharton ISD school board, so <laughs> I also am a former politician. I retired undefeated after one term. Also, in keeping with the, uh, the, uh, uh, one of the themes of today's meeting that I was not aware of, I majored in geology as well. I ended up as a pediatrician, and I'm not sure how that happened, but we won't get into that. My uh, talk today is to revisit the Mar de Lodo, and uh, I realize that there are enough people here that don't know what the Mar de Lodo is that I thought I better visit it before I revisit it. So very briefly, I'm going to visit the Mar de Lodo and tell you the story of the Mexican Army after the Battle of San Jacinto. Since we are at the San Jacinto uh, Conference, I thought it was reasonable to start at the Battle of San Jacinto. I'd like to start the moment the Mexican Army realized that things were not going to go well. And Santana uh, decided he, is, he would basically take off. He left with probably about 60 soldiers. And uh, he had his private bodyguard with him. They were members of the Tampico Cavalry. And one of these leaders was Miguel Aguirre, Captain Miguel Aguirre. Another was Marcus Badagan. Uh, Jeff Dunn has found a fascinating document that has a, uh, an account of this flight by an unknown Mexican officer. And we've been able to detail, by the details he gives, we've been able to determine that was Marcus Badagan. These uh, 60 Mexican soldiers took off with Santa Ana and fled towards Vinces Bridge, and, and, and indeed we've got documents from the Mexican side that said the bridge was burned. And so they couldn't get across uh, uh, the bayou, and they ended up uh, getting all uh, disorganized, and of course, as you know, Santana was captured the next day. Uh, Miguel Aguirre made it into camp. Now, he came in not by himself, but he came in with Casa's wagon train. Uh, most, a lot of people don't realize that General uh, Koss he, he did not have his wagon train with him. He had a hundred soldiers that he'd left to guard that wagon train, so they hightailed it back to Old Fort, which is now Rich and, Richmond Rosenberg. And Miguel Aguirre came in with him. He's wounded in the thigh, and he tells Philosola this terrible news of this big defeat. Well, making a very long story somewhat short, Philosola decides that the best thing to do is reunite all the Mexican forces in the area. Most people don't realize, as we've talked about this morning, that the Battle of San Jacinto is not the end of the story. We had 2,500 Mexican soldiers in the area. Uh, the vast majority of them were at Old Fort or in Colombia and Brazoria under Urrea. He has immediately got Urrea to join him, and they eventually, after some uh, very weird uh, uh, messages back and forth. They eventually ended up at Mrs. Powell's Tavern, and you've heard Jim talk about Madam Powell's Tavern. This is where they had their big meeting to decide what to do. Now, remember when they had this meeting, they had no idea whether Santana was alive or dead. They didn't know if there were any survivors other than the few that had trickled in, including Miguel Aguirre. So, the generals had a big meeting on April 25th, 1836 at Madame Powell's Tavern to decide what to do. Now remember, this is not hysterical retreat if you're stopping and resting for a day and having a, a, a council of war. They had this big meeting and they decided what they were going to do was they were going to withdraw to Victoria, they were going to get resupplied, they were going to retrain their troops, they were going to wait on orders from the Mexican government. 
They did not decide to leave Texas. They did not rush out of Texas. It was not mass confusion. They had a plan. What happened was they left Mrs. Powell's on April 26th and they started co crossing the San Bernard River. And when they started crossing the river, it started to rain. And it rained and it rained and it rained probably for more than 24 hours. They talked about it like being pitchers of water being poured, up, poured upon their heads. And it just, they, they, it was terrible. Unfortunately for them, they got across the San Bernard before it rained that hard. Because when they got to the next river that they were going to cross was the West Bernard, it was flooded. Now this was April 27th that they got to the West Bernard. It was flooded, they couldn't get across. They decided, well, we'll spend the night. Well, that afternoon, the Mexican courier, the Presidio soldier that uh, De Def Smith had found, came into camp with the orders from Santa Ana. So now remember, they've made this plan and they've decided to withdraw to Victoria. Now they find out that Santana is alive and now they get their orders that he says to retreat. Uh, I've not mentioned this particular thing to my audiences before, but I've thought about it a lot and I've, I realized if they had actually obeyed his orders, things may have gone much better for them. So my, thesis, my, uh, my theme has always been they didn't obey his orders, and I stand by that, but looking backwards, I wonder if they should have. That's a discussion for another day. Anyway, they decided that since they couldn't get across the West Bernard, they were going to go north, and they were going to go up to the same crossing that they had used when they were coming the opposite direction. So they went back to Atascacita Crossing. Now, if you look at the orders Santa Ana gave them, they obviously paid no attention to his orders, okay? I think that's very important to understand that the Mexican army was not defeated. They still had plenty of fight in them. They still planned on fighting, but they were gonna withdraw. Well, when they started going north towards the Tascacita Crossing, which by the way is around just about eight miles south of Columbus, Texas, they got stuck in what's nowadays called the Lissy Prairie. And the Lissy Prairie is about the worst place in the world to be when it's wet. It's rice farms now, and it's basically what the locals used to call quicksand. They say it's much better now than it used to be, and it's really bad now. Uh, when they got in there, the Mexican army, uh, Filosola called it the Mar de Lodo, the Sea of Mud. And this is what, uh, my talk is usually entitled, this is what our archeological report is entitled, and I'm glad to say that uh, after Jim Chris finishes with it, I've, I've, I'm gonna be publishing a book called The Mar de Lodo. Uh, they got into this mud and Phyllis Sola said it was so bad that they had to uh, unpack the mules. They had 1,200 mules, they had 120 wagons, they had eight pieces of artillery, they had 2,500 soldiers, they had 1,500 female camp followers. So we're talking about a, a small town moving through this mud. He said they, that the only thing that was holding the mules up from sinking was the packs. He said otherwise the mules would have disappeared from sight. He said they had to take the packs off the mules and then they had to carry the packs to these small elevated areas. He said then they had to carry the mules. So you can imagine the Mexican soldiers basically carrying mules to these elevated uh, places. You can imagine them having to pull large pieces of artillery through this. It took the, the artillery and the wagons and the wounded, it took them nine days to get through this mud. And uh, the, uh, the uh, artifacts that we have discovered are the artifacts that they left in the mud there, the ones the Texans didn't pick up. This first slide that I've got up here is, uh, is, uh, is one of the earlier slides, and I'm not gonna show all my first set of slides because several, several of you have seen them so many times. A lot of the artifacts of those original slides are out here on our exhibition table. The best ones, including this eagle, are at the Alamo. Make sure you visit the Alamo. I won't put any more plugs in for the Alamo, but they have a gift shop there, and we have a lot of our artifacts there. Jan DeVault's working vigorously, and I'm working with her that we want to get a lot of these art artifacts also on display at the San Jacinto Museum. 
This uh, 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 eagle is uh, probably pre-1821. We think it went on a belt buckle. Now we're going to revisit the Mar de Lodo. Now that we've visited the Mar de Lodo, we're going to go back and I'm going to give you an update and I'm going to tell you some interesting history that we've found. We've learned a lot more about the history. Terry, you want to give me the next slide there? First of all, I want to, and I know you can't see this, but it's, it's, it's a reminder for me to tell you that there is a third archaeological publication in the works, and I know I've been saying that for about two years now, uh, but I promise that uh, uh, in traditional archaeological style, we will get this out. It just won't be in a timely manner. I don't think archaeologists ever work in a timely manner. Uh, this is a... a, a a, a map of the Powell home site. And we've got all the artifacts that we found documented. We did GPS and we put them on the site based on what we found there. And uh, the young man uh, working the slide projectors, Terry Keeler, he made this map. And Terry's been just like a major force in this excavation. Um, one thing we found is what we think we've been able to pretty much identify the Mexican line, the, Mexican, the main Mexican line where they camped at Mrs. Powell's. And at the far end, we found some artifacts. Terry, can you give me the next slide? At the far end of this Mexican line, we found some artifacts that seemed to be, there, there was more ceramics, and we found this rectangular button. It's very ornate, I know you can't tell it. I've asked my buddies if they've ever seen rectangular buttons and, and they said that this is a first for them. It's silver plated and it's very ornate and we consider it a civilian button. So we are theorizing that we've basically found where the, the soldaderas, the, the uh, camp followers camped at the far end. Next slide. One other artifact that we found out there and we almost discarded this as a piece of a beer can. We just about thought, oh, that's, that's aluminum. And then we realized, no, that's not aluminum, that's silver. And we found, uh, Terry found this artifact, and we found it right in the Mexican line in, in a uh, rice field, interestingly enough. And we've shown this to several of our uh, fellow Mexican army uh, uh, lovers, and so far nobody's been able to give us any detail other than the fact that it's a decorative item. It obviously has a hole in it. We think it might have decorated a saddle, uh, et cetera. You want to give me the next slide, Terry? This is uh, real interesting because we found this and the next artifacts that I'm going to show you. We found them in the very same area. This is a lock and a key, and uh, it's brass. And you can see that the key has a diamond shape, and then the, the uh, lock has a diamond shape. We think it was probably on a small wooden box. Of course, the box is gone. Terry, you can give me the next slide. In the same general area, we found money. And it's kind of interesting. We, found, we, we have found very few coins. And when we find them, they've been very small. These, are, these, were, were, uh, these surprised us. The, in that area of that lock and key, these two larger coins are eight real coins. Uh, they're Spanish. One's 1814, the other one's 1815. And the middle coin, which is broken in half, and by the way, we did not break it. it. It had been broken, we don't know, possibly at the time it was dropped because it's very thin. That's a four real coin. Uh, it's so worn, there's no date on that. But we found these, Terry, can you give me the next slide? We found these in the same area, so we think it might have been a money box. This is the back of the same coins. You can give me the next slide. I threw this in here because uh, a lot of people have been very interested in the knife that we found uh, that's at the Alamo. We have a, uh, a buoy knife, for, for lack of a better word. I'm going to let the guys that are experts on buoy knives argue about whether they should be called that and whether ours is one of them. But we've had several people look at that knife in the Alamo and they say that it's very classic design. It's got, I believe they call it a coffin tipped handle. Uh, and, and we had always forgotten somehow to get a good slide of the tip that we believe went on that knife. We believe this was a brass tip that was at the very top of the handle on that knife. So a little bit of more information for you knife lovers. Next slide, please. By the way, that knife was in a site that is very unique. We don't think it's part of the Mar de Lodo. We think that that knife was found at a site that's an Orea site. We believe that we've stumbled across 
a, a site that was an advancing Mexican Army site. We think it was Urrea as he was crossing the West Bernard River probably April 19th, 1836. We believe that's what we found there. Uh, these are brass uh, or copper, I should say copper. The Texans called them copper shot. Uh, the Mexicans actually called them bronze. For some reason, I've ended up calling everything here brass, but to me, you can use the words interchangeably, brass, bronze, copper. But this is, it, this is copper shot. We've only found three of these musket balls uh, that are copper. The rest of them are all lead, but it's, the reason I wanted to bring this up is because I wanted to tell an interesting story and that is this idea about the copper shot being poisonous. Uh, one of Jim's favorite characters, Herman Ehrenberg, talked about how they used poisonous copper shot, the Mexicans did. And I found an article in the New York newspaper that talked about the vile, evil Mexicans, how villainous that they would use copper shot because everybody knows that copper shot is poisonous and if you get wounded, you will die because the copper. Um, Dr. Labadi's uh, a story of San Jacinto talks about a young soldier named Olwen Trask. Olwen Trask was wounded on April 20th during the skirmish. I say skirmish, it, it, was, it was, I believe, more than that. There was cannon fire from both sides and Trask said that he heard the cannon fire and then he felt a stinging in his knee. Well, Dr. Labadi examined him and told the other physicians that he felt like it was probably canister from a cannon and he thought it was probably copper and they better get it out. Well, he said, he said and, and as a physician, I can feel for this, he said, but he wasn't my patient. He was these other doctors' patient. <laughs> he said, so I, I let them take care of it. It's like I went and took care of my patients. Um, I don't know if he had insurance or not. <laughs> he said that about three days later at De Zavala's house, which by the way is where they took all the wounded, at De Zavala's house he came across Trask again and he said Trask was suffering greatly. And now he was even more convinced that this was the evil copper canister shot. And he told him, you've got to, you've got to uh, amputate. He said he actually, that Trask begged him to amputate his, his leg. And he said he went to get his gear, but by the time he got back, Trask had been moved to Galveston. And he said he finally caught up with him in Galveston, and by the time he was in Galveston, it was too late, too late to amputate. And uh, Trask died, Olwen Trask died, and he said uh, after he died, they, at the autopsy, they took out the ball, and he said it was one of the evil brass or copper shots indeed, and that's why he died. And, I, and I, I, I think it's really fascinating to think that the, both sides used primarily lead. And as you know now, it's lead that we found out that's poisonous. And if they had all used copper shot, they probably would have had less trouble. <laughs> Next slide, please. This to me is uh, one of the more exciting things that I wanted to show you today. This is uh, uh, an item that was discovered uh, in an in a, uh, area that's already been excavated, but we, when we are bored, go out and re-excavate areas and look for new things. And uh, I, uh, I know I had uh, excavated or metal detected within five feet of this object 10 times. And I missed it every time, and my buddy Terry down there stumbled across this. He said it was such a good reading that he knew it was a beer can. But he dug it up anyway, and here was this amazing artifact in almost pristine condition. This is a, this is a Granaderos insignia. It's an exploding bomb. Uh, we have another one that we had found before, but not near this fancy. This one's a lot bigger. It's, it's got the same size and attachments as our uh, Morelos belt plate. So we think that this may have been a belt plate, but it's got an engraving on it that you can see a scroll engraved on the front. And my good friend from uh, Port Isabel, Manuel Hinojosa, who knows about as much about the Mexican army as anybody I know, says that he's never seen that scroll on anything but hatware. So he thinks that this could be from a Shaco plate. 
Uh, just like many of these insignia, we just have to say it's either from the Shaco or a cross belt plate, or remember the cartridge boxes had a lot of these on them. Um, next slide, please. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the back. I wanted to show you the connectors. Uh, these were classic connectors. They're what we call pinched back connectors. Uh, it's amazing to me that this artifact uh, uh, ended up in this good a condition. Uh, I think that's the last slide. Is that all, Terry? Yep, that's it. I wanted to tell you one other story. I think I have a couple more minutes. I wanted to tell you another story that I've discovered, and, and I'm including it in my book, but it, to me, is is, is one of these heart-rendering stories that makes these uh, occurrences so human. This, this uh, story happens to be from the Texan side. Um, there was a Texan named Samuel T. Brown, who, uh, you know, as far as I know, he was a, uh, not a very famous, uh, important guy. And I believe he came with Ward, and I believe he came from Georgia, if I'm not mistaken. I don't know much about his background. But I know he was captured with Ward by Urea near, near uh, Victoria. And, and y'all probably know they sent that group down to join Fannin's men. And that, I believe that was about 70 men, and they were included in the massacre. So Samuel T. Brown was marched out with, I, oh gosh, massacution? It's not a massacre, it's not an execution, it's a massacution. <laughs> Samuel T. Brown was marched out, and he, was, and he escaped with his life. I mean, that's pretty amazing. I, I, was it 13 or 18? I know Jim would, uh, would know the numbers, but there weren't that many survivors. He was one of the guys that survived. And there were, there were three of them that were traveling together. Of course, the conditions were terrible. They had to travel mainly at night. They were actually captured once, and for some reason, the guy got distracted and let him go. They just took off and let him go. So he was recaptured once and then was let go. So then he got all the way back from Victoria, he got all the way back to the Colorado River, which is a pretty good jaunt. Well, crossing the Colorado River, he got recaptured again. So now he's been captured the third time by the Mexican army. So, and, and, and they took him to Filosola's camp. So now he's at Old Fort. And this is prior to the Battle of San Jacinto, and he's a captive there. He even mentions who he was a captive with. He gives two or three names, and we've been able to trace one of them back to a guy that was captured at uh, San Felipe. Uh, but he gets to, he gets to, to uh, 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 Old Fort, and it's just a matter of days later that they get the news of the Battle of San Jacinto. He says by now his boots have been stolen, and, and so he gets to join the Mexican army in their retreat. So now he's gone, he's escaped and made it all the way to Richmond Rosenberg. Now they drag him all the way back. And, he, and several of those prisoners were taken uh, along with him and he had to go barefoot all the way through the Mar de Lodo. So he was included in this whole uh, disastrous uh, withdrawal and eventual retreat. Well, they didn't let him go for some reason. They let several of the prisoners go, but Samuel T. Brown got to go all the way to Mexico City. They took him to Mexico City. Phyllis Sola pro finally brought him back to Matamoros, and in July of 1837, they put him on a ship to go to New Orleans. So this guy was initially captured in March of 1836, and he got freed in July of 1837. Pretty amazing story. Um, in conclusions, I would like to reiterate that in my mind, one of the major turning points, and I know we're getting built up on turning points, in my mind, one of the major turning points was the Mar de Lodo. Uh, I believe that the Mexican army still had some fight in them till they got trapped in this mud pit. And once again, talking about uh, 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 hinges of fate, it seemed like anything that could possibly go wrong for the Mexican army really, really did including the Mar de Lodo. So that's my, uh, my theme is that the Mexican army still had some fight. They did not obey Santa Ana's order, but after the Mar de Lodo, even though Urrea was finally put in charge and even though he was supposedly the aggressive uh, uh, attack-oriented, don't-retreat guy, 
he went ahead and retreated anyway, because I believe that by that time, things were pretty much sunk. I appreciate your uh, 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 attendance today, and thanks for your attention. I would vote for Greg Dimmick for governor. <laughs> he, he, he shows up. Uh, it's, it's sort of a funny story, but uh, as, as some of you may know, we have asked the governor of the state of Texas every year to attend our San Jacinto Day celebrations, and there's always something. And when, when we asked Governor White, and he was delighted to do it, in the back of my mind, I remember this experience we had had with governors, and I think we may be through with governors. <laughs> but we, we vote for you. Um,